Be careful what you wish for, Parker. Hello, Peter. So as you all should have hopefully noticed by now, Spider-Man No Way Home is now literally under a month away from release date. And unless you've been living under a rock your whole life, it's been pretty evident the internet has exploded as almost no one can stop talking about it. I mean, are we really surprised though? The movie's been announced since 2019 and now it's virtually on the horizon, so expect to be overwhelmed. So with the movie so close to releasing, and since us Brits are getting a two-day shortcut ticket from the Americans, I thought what better to do than upload a 10-20 to 20 minute long video essay closely analysing every minute detail right to the brim and make a series of unbelievably nerdy theories whilst talking in front of my camera for an eternity because who else has already done that? I mean just scrolling through your daily YouTube recommendations and search options should be enough to get the message. Damn I'm so inventive I really should achieve a certificate from YouTube or something for my inspiring changes to mankind. But anyway, with Sony dropping the second trailer last week, we now have two trailers and they're both nothing but goated. Saw the first one, loved it, saw the second one, couldn't have loved it more. So with that in mind, here are five things we just have to see in No Way Home and trust me, by the end of the video, you'll be nodding your head so much you'll be shaking uncontrollably. And don't worry guys, I'm not actually going to do all that crap, I mean everyone's already doing it daily and I ain't going to make the video that long, so relax and enjoy yourself. Also, beware there will be major spoilers for Venom that there be carnage in this video. I mean, you really should have seen it already, but peek if you haven't. As well as the hypothesis that I could end up accidentally spoiling the movie for any of you all. So if you're really hard on spoilers, leave now. Alright, let's go. Number 1. Make the Sinister Six work as a team. Now by far the biggest thing about this movie, ignoring the three Spider-Men teaming up of course, is definitely the Sinister Six. I mean, Sony's been trying and failing with this for years now, with each repeated new movie attempting to set up a failed universe. And here we are, seven years later, and Sony seems they've finally managed to receive a W, so let's hand it to them there at least. Now, so far we have five confirmed villains, Doc Ock, Green Goblin and Sandman from the Raimi movies, along with Electro and Lizard from the Amazing Spider-Man movies. And most of these are pretty awesome villains, certainly Ock and Goblin, Sandman I guess to a lesser degree and the other two not so much, but still, who doesn't vibe with Electro's kick-ass theme song? So if you all haven't noticed already, I am super excited to now finally be seeing all five of these villains, plus an unknown candidate who is probably Venom, but maybe not, meeting on screen together for the first time. But as every logical person would say, what good is there in seeing all of these guys team up together if they're not a good team? This is where I want to see the character development, the chemistry, really kick in to each of these villains and their connections to one another. Remember Sony, each of these villains have all encountered Spider-Man. Maybe the same one or a different one, but nonetheless, Spider-Man. And they've each lost their separate battles and have had different experiences with him. And now here they all are sucks into an alternate universe where this Spider-Man is taking school trips into space and punching purple Genghis Khan titans. And so naturally there's a lot of magic juice they can put together with all that, so don't waste the story. Have the villains talk to each other and share their different experiences with Spider-Man with one another. Have Doc Ock tell Goblin of how that one time he sped a train which knocked Peter unconscious. Have Electro tell Lizard of how Spider-Man is so selfish because he forgets everyone's names. Heck, Electro doesn't even know Peter's identity, so there's something you can learn from. You could even have someone like Sandman or maybe even Doc Ock tell the others of the truth about Spider-Man, how he's not actually that bad of a guy. Either way, the point is there's a ton of awesome stuff they can do here with these six sinister villains. So making their character interactions work and having them successfully put Peter in a vulnerable spot would be exactly what we all wanted. Remember, they've all fought Spider-Man. They all know Spider-Man, they've known him personally, either as a science bro, a disabled science bro, a friend, a random thug who killed your uncle, or your best friend's psycho dad. Basically, so long as Sony and Marvel can fulfill all the hype and make this the badass team we all know it's gonna be, then I'm totally down for it. Oh, and by the way, the new design for Electro looks sick. The only thing I'm not a huge fan of is the fact that he's now basically just a guy with sparks all over him. I know The Amazing Spider-Man 2 received a lot of criticism for its villain, but one thing I've always liked about Electro in that film was his neon blue design. I just like the way he looks less human and more alien, because I can't lie, this Electro does look pretty sketchy, especially when he's got a hood on. 
Regardless, I couldn't have been happier to see my boy Max Dillon returning to the silver screen and man oh man is he rocking that sleek ass crown. Number 2. Peter Parker should make his own suit for once and not just a Stark Tech one. Okay, so this one's a little more personal and if I'm being honest, it doesn't need to happen at all. In fact, if we're being realistic, he's probably going to need a little bit of tech if he's fighting 1v6 against his biggest villains. So yeah, with that in mind, this one's probably the least relevant one on the list, but whatever. I still think it'd be better if for once, Peter turned away from the Stark-based equipment and techie multi-billion dollar super suits and instead just made his own one. Or at least if he's having help from someone else, just keep it more basic. Sort of like with Andrew in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, when he got Gwen to help him out with electro-proofing his suit. Because the benefits of this are actually much more justified than you think. Peter's a really smart guy and a lot of the movies fail to successfully show that, so it'd be a great opportunity for this movie to take up on by making Peter hand make his own suit. And if he can't have tech from Stark, then that's fine, he can just make it himself. Now I know Peter's smart, and the MCU has shown that pretty well already, but I mean, he's not Tony Stark. He can't just create new elements and time machines like that overnight. But still, it wouldn't hurt or extend Peter's intelligence to outside his general realm to make him at least manufacture a couple gadgets of his own. Like we've already seen him with his own web shooter, so how about a magnetic implant in his suit to attract Doc Ock's arms, or an electric absorber to absorb Electro's lightning blasts? Okay, those were two very trash examples, but you get the point, don't you? And make no mistake, I have nothing against the MCU giving Peter Stark tech, and really I have nothing against Tony and Peter's relationship at all. I actually really like it. However, I feel like now's the time to fully emerge him out of Stark's shadow, and make him a completely independent character who can at least make his own suit all things considered. <laughs> and I know, the MCU has technically already given Peter his own homemade suit, and while it's certainly more realistic than the models Toby and Andrew made, it, it looks like trash, really. At the time of Civil War and even Homecoming's release, I'd be totally fine with him wearing this junk, however when he's facing off against his six biggest villains of all time with Toby and Andrew by his side, he's going to need to be looking clean as can be. Now looking at shots in the trailer, it definitely looks like Sony isn't going to be changing anytime soon, and that's fine, however here's to hope they will. Number 3. Restore Doc Ock and Sandman's Redemption Arcs Okay, so this is another one I've been seeing going around a lot recently, and I gotta say I totally agree with it. Now as you all should have known, unlike the rest of the villains, Doc Ock from Spider-Man 2 and Sandman from Spider-Man 3 didn't die as villains. Well, I mean, technically, Ock didn't die on screen, he just supposedly fell into a river, and Sandman just flew off into the wind, so... And that's not even as simple as them dying good guys, since they actually had legitimate redemption arcs written very nicely by Sam Raimi throughout both films. Ock's one being about using your intelligence as a gift for mankind, and Sandman's one being about forgiveness. And I can't lie, both are really great arcs, and to see them get ruined would be beyond disappointing. Now as for the other villains, they all died evil so I don't really care what they do with them. But in Ock and Sandman's cases, it just would make absolutely no sense at all if they suddenly came back, took one look at Spider-Man and were like, First, we attack his heart. And so that's why I was really relieved to see the trailers advertising Doc Ock questioning the reality of his situation he's in. Think about it, he's just fallen into an alternate universe where this universe's Peter Parker doesn't even have a Doc Ock. It would just be ludicrous if he were to die a hero in Spider-Man 2 but come back in No Way Home and suddenly be a villain again. That just completely defeats the point of his arc in Spider-Man 2, which he taught himself. So instead, what I think it would be better for them to do is basically as follows. Cut back to his death scene from Spider-Man 2 where he's under the river and is drowning, but have a portal or something open up beneath him which takes him all the way to the MCU's universe, specifically this setting right here. Then, as he's waking up, because his mind is probably all over the place and slightly affected by this interdimensional travel, out of confusion he sees Tom's Peter and somehow views him as a threat or something, and then attacks him in the midst of his arrival. But upon further investigation, Ock eventually finds out this is not the Peter he knows from his universe, and in this scene right here, which I believe is Doctor Strange's prison or something, here should be where he and Tom's Peter come up with some kind of agreement where they both agree to help each other with their own individual problems. In fact, to even further emphasise just how vital Ock's arc from the last movie is, he could even pretend to be a baddie working for the Sinister Six, but at some point during the climax he can, like, switch sides or something and possibly even sacrifice himself for Peter. 
And I know I'm kind of just repeating everything Full Fat Videos has already said in his video. It was an awesome guy, by the way. Sub to him if you haven't already. But it's all just facts. What's the point in bringing back all these childhood icon villains only to destroy their established arcs? And so here's the hope they don't ruin Sandman and Doc Ock's redemption arcs and can somehow restore it in a way that pays tribute to both characters. Number 4. Tom shouldn't save MJ, Andrew Garfield should. So as we can see in the final few seconds of the second trailer, MJ is in some pretty hardcore danger. And of course, when everyone first saw this, including me, we all immediately thought of that very controversial yet beautiful scene from The Amazing Spider-Man 2 where Peter failed to save Gwen Stacy. Now at first glance, this may seem just like another leap towards nostalgia. I mean, what in this movie isn't nostalgia? But on second thoughts, they could actually turn this into a really great and beneficial scene by doing just one thing. Don't have Tom save MJ. In fact, when Tom's reaching his hand out to grab MJ here, have him fail. What, just so that MJ can be sent falling to her death? See, this is exactly where they could bring in Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man and have him save MJ instead of Tom. Because in his universe, Peter failed to save his girl, he failed to save the love of his life, and as a result, his whole life was basically destroyed. So he knows what it's like to lose a loved one. No, not that old bozo. This one. And with all that emotional weight and regret still inside of him, it would be downright crucial for him not to let that happen to someone else, let alone an alternate variant of himself. Because that's just what Spider-Man does. So to have Andrew save MJ instead of Tom would be the perfect and most logical thing for a character like him to do, and it's exactly what fans want to see. And alas, here we come to my final suggestion for you Sony, but I mean Marvel. Number 5. Don't ruin the Sinister Six. Now this heavily ties in with my third point on redemption arc, so I'm not going to keep this one too long, but I don't think anyone's going to want to say they want the Sinister Six to be ruined. Now before anyone accuses me, no, this is not an excuse for me to rant about the MCU's villain problem. As a matter of fact, I don't actually think the MCU's villains are that bad. I mean, take a closer look and you'll actually see we've had more than a few good villains. But it becomes a little different when you start taking villains from separate universes and put them under the guide of directors with different directing styles and ideas than their previous original director. You see, Doc Ock and Goblin were, and still are, household names in the Spider-Man world. And as everyone knows, both Willem Dafoe and Alfred Molina were great at representing their respective characters. But it's not even just their acting. Dafoe and Molina's acting somehow perfectly merges with Raimi's directing style and especially his humour. And not just these two, practically every Raimi trilogy character might as well glue themselves onto Raimi. Literally. There's just something so magical in how perfectly these actors' performances align with Raimi's directing style, particularly with all the corny jokes. And I mean, those things are so special, I doubt many directors would successfully be able to replicate them. Now, I'm not saying Marvel are going to totally ruin these villains and that they totally aren't going to pull it off. But here's the hope they can at least maintain the good qualities of their original characters and not throw in stupid jokes like over here. What was your name again? Dr. Otto Octavius. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no, seriously, what's your actual name? So long as they keep them entertaining and menacing, as well as all those standout goblin quotes, yeah, I surrender. then I'm confident nothing will go wrong. Plus, if we're talking from experience, John Watts is already a pretty damn good at directing villains. I mean, Vulture is arguably the best live-action Spider-Man villain, and Mysterio ain't far behind. And yeah, they should probably just leave Doctor Strange out of all this, because he's just so much more powerful than everyone else, and it just wouldn't really work if he's there in the final battle. So there are a few of my thoughts on Spider-Man No Way Home. I know I definitely didn't mention enough stuff, but let's be real, if I included every last thing I wanted to see in this movie, I'd be dead before you all could even see the video. But let's just stick with this, alright? Make sure to like this video, sub to the channel for more content, and drop a comment explaining your thoughts on the movie. And yeah, for all you pathetic doubters out there, Toby and Andrew are 100% in the movie. Just, if you disagree, just cope. Alright, see you next time.